photograph of the Vasa, a very famous Swedish warship that um, was built at enormous expense and sank. Uh, in January of 1625, the king of Sweden signed a contract commissioning this, this warship, and he intended it to be the showpiece of the Swedish Navy. It was hugely expensive. It took more than three years. Um, a lot of trees were felled. 400 men worked on it. And then, uh, three years later, three and a bit years later, in August of 1628, the ship set out with a great deal of fanfare on her maiden voyage, holding not only the sailors on the ship, but some of their wives and families, and uh, capsized and sank to the bottom of Stockholm Harbor. And she sat there until she was finally lifted more or less intact in 1961. Now, we don't know what went on, all of the details of what went on during that three-year project. Uh, clearly, in a project of that nature, a lot of people know a lot of things. As we know from, from doing software projects, there are a lot of people on the ground who know a lot. But those things don't always get up to the people who need to know. So it's clear that the Vasa was top-heavy in, in the way she was designed. She was carrying too many guns too high up on the ship. Um, we also don't know uh, what happened in terms of changing requirements in this, this very high-profile project that had a fixed launch date and clearly also a very demanding and powerful customer, all powerful in this case because it was an absolute monarch. Um, Although it's interesting that uh, the, the changing requirements and fixed launch date and so on was something that was mentioned by the tour guide when, when I went around in the Vasa Museum. However, there is one thing that we do know about, and this is a standard test that was conducted at this shipyard and, and possibly at all shipyards in the 17th century. Uh, there was a stability test just before launch. Uh, typically, what they did was in the completed ship, they would have somewhere between 50 and 100 men run from side to side of the ship and then run from end to end. And in this case, they actually abandoned the test before it was complete because the ship was rocking so much that they knew it was unstable. Who knew? Who knew? And in fact, I, why, when this happened, was this unstable ship launched on schedule? Well, maybe, just maybe, it was because nobody dared tell the king so, or, or other people under the king who had authority to make the decision to hold off on the launch and find out what the problem was. It was an uncomfortable, more than uncomfortable in this case, project truth. Very unwelcome news. We are people on this webinar and I, project managers, testers, potentially test leads, consultants, we are people who are paid to tell the truth as we see it. It's what managements typically expect, although they may not like it when they get it. The reality is that what we see, that, that truth that we see, sometimes is often quite evident fact, the elephant that's right there and I'm touching it, can be very unwelcome news to the powerful people who really need to hear that message so they can make the appropriate decisions. There aren't very many ma senior managers who want to hear bad news. They don't want to hear that a project is failing. Uh, they don't want to hear that testing has, has discovered that quality on a critical system or a strategic system is threatening a planned launch. And the reality is that when, when we come with bad news, it can be very threatening to the person who is hearing that bad news. That's what this webinar is about. How can we deliver bad news in a way that means that um, it's the, the information we communicate is going to be treated as valuable and, it, that it, and in a way that it's going to be given the right consideration so that people can make the decisions that they are paid to make. I think it's good to take a step back and, and look at a model of what happens when people communicate. I'm going to use the Satir action model, which I find a very valuable way for looking at how interactions between people occur. It starts with, with intake. 
people taking in information, the meaning that they then attribute to what they have taken in, the significance, i.e., how they feel about the meaning that they have attributed to the information that they have taken in, and then how they respond to that message, to that significance, and to their feelings about all of that. Um, you'll see in that model that a lot depends on intake, first of all, because if not enough is taken in or the wrong things are taken in, someone mishears or, or misinterprets and then attributes meaning to what they have misheard and then has feelings about that and then responds, you could be in a very difficult situation. So let's look at this model in a little more detail. Intake is what the recipient actually takes in. And there are lots of things that can affect that. Um, of course, the message content and the presentation. How you convey that message and what's in it. So what are the words? What is the message itself? And then how are you, how are you holding yourself? How are you conducting yourself? What body language are they perceiving from you? What tone? Um, is also very important, and perhaps the pitch of your words. How are they related to you in, in the organization? Are, are you in a subordinate role? Well, that often happens when you're delivering this kind of message. Really what you're doing is potentially you're in a position of speaking truth to power. So uh, the power relationships can be very important. Mutual trust is also very important. And then there are the communication preferences that that person has. Uh, are they people who prefer a direct approach? Are they people who, who uh, would really prefer something a little bit more indirect and working around to the gist of a message? Uh, is this a person who, who insists on diving down into the detail and wants all of it right up front? Or is this someone who says, who says just give me the gist? And then there are cultural differences. Some of those may have to do with national cultural differences. Uh, this is particularly important in, in European countries where you, have, where, where you may have many different cultural, uh, national cultures at play. But of course, uh, we all work often in, in multinational corporations and, uh, and we will encounter national cultural differences and, and cultural preferences. Uh, those are not hard and fast, but they can become an issue. Someone's accent. Somebody, uh, a person may mishear or, or hear slightly differently something because of a national accent that they don't quite uh, understand. There's also the state of mind of the recipient. If that person slept badly the night before or, or uh, they're worrying about their kid who is sick, um, they're in the middle of a messy divorce, or, or in fact worrying about a work problem, then, then that can also affect how much they take in and how they take it in. And then, of course, there's the ambient stuff that's always around us. Any noise, uh, external distractions, people going by, people knocking on the door, all of those things. When someone has taken something in, a message in, then they begin to attribute meaning to it, and they interpret what they've heard. Uh, there are a lot of things that can influence that as well. One thing is the information that the recipient might supply themselves to fill in any gaps in the message. We don't typically say what we want to say spelling out every single word in the message. There's a great example for this in, um, in an excellent article Dale Emery wrote. On, uh, on the satiric interaction model, which is in the, in the references at the end. And um, 